And even the Bible tells us, and I believe it's Paul, that lets us know that we're not to repay evil for evil. But you and I know that until Jesus Christ comes back, that even being saved and filled with the Holy Spirit is a very difficult thing to do. I don't care who you are. You can sit up here tonight and fool me, but you, you, I'm, I'm telling you what I know. And the second thing is that when what Peter really shows us, what I found through just reading his epistles, is that when you live a life that represents Jesus Christ through and through, you can prepare to, to be introduced to sufferings. There's no doubt about it. There's no way to get away from it. There's no way to hide from it. And you see where we're living in the age and the hour that, we're, that God has called us to stand up and to be bold in Him, that these things are even becoming more, more prevalent each and every day. And I really honestly believe in my soul, I'm, I'm talking my soul, I honestly believe uh, that uh, Christians in modern day Christendom uh, are really just, oh, we're really at the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, when it comes to uh, being persecuted. You know, there are a lot of, uh, so, there are a lot of uh, authentic and genuine believers who, who believe and represent Jesus Christ who are in foreign nations that, that really have to do things in secret, really have to do things in hiding because it could jeopardize their lives and the lives of their loved ones. And America, in, in most, I'd say in most scenarios, in most instances, haven't really faced that yet. But it's coming. It's coming. So those are the two uh, baselines that I want to start you out with tonight is the nobility piece. And just to give you a little background, and I like to do that before we get into any book, uh, to challenge you and to kind of motivate you and fire you up a little bit. Uh, Peter's teachings are very unique, uh, even in ecology, and uh, there are even some theologians today that believe uh, that based on the uh, vocabulary and some of the literary style of how the letter has been written, uh, don't believe because, you know, Acts 4, I believe Acts 4 and 13 reminds us that uh, Peter is nothing but an uneducated fisherman. So you have a lot of modern uh, theological debate as if he, you know, to the authorship of this letter. Uh, it hasn't been proven otherwise, uh, but a lot of people say that these are the, uh, we're in First Peter tonight, Brother Ross. We are, you know, they, they say, well, man, it sounds like that literary style and the vocabulary you sounds a lot like who? Paul. Apostle Paul, right? But again, you got a lot of critics, but again, there is no, uh, there's no uh, consistent affirmation that affirms that fact. It is only uh, speculation. Uh, you're going to see tonight, even when we start uh, uh, Peter's epistle, that the region of the earth that he's in, and the reason why we talk about pilgrim and pilgrimship, and how God has, has, has sent and ordained uh, certain believers in, in every part of the earth, in certain parts of the earth, we call it a missionary. You know, we refer to it as an evangelist or missionaries on an evangelistic tour to go out and, and spread the good news. Uh, typically, uh, what you see, even in Bible, is that God would use a man or a woman uh, to go uh, in, a, in a nation or in a place uh, outside their, their local uh, habitat, which is a good thing. It scares a lot of us sometimes because of the fear of the unknown, but you know, we might have some missionary evangelists sitting in the room tonight. Amen. So it's a good thing. So again, two points of reference tonight. Uh, Jotting down two points of reference. And I know these these will eventually grow, but the nobility of a believer and the guarantee Specifically to the to those who who serve uh, Jesus Christ. All right, let's get started. First Peter tonight, chapter one, verse one. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and we know this. All right, he is an apostle. A lot of people can you can say what you want, but he he. According to, to the word that I read, is the only one that can say that he walked on water. 
Right. You can say what you want. He denied Christ and he profaned. And, you know, of course, uh, Jesus Christ prophesied some of the things that, a lot of the things that Peter, uh, you know, did. And the, we call it prognostication or whatever, you know, big fancy word we want to use. But at the end of the day, he was an apostle. He was one that, that physically walked with Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can be dubbed as the one that walked on water. He's the only one that can be dubbed as receiving the keys to heaven or the revelation of the church that through Jesus Christ that would eventually connect him with Cornelius. And we've been, we, I think we've, we've covered this before in Acts chapter 10 and eventually the gospel of the good news being spread uh, to the Gentile people in the Gentile community. So this, should, this shouldn't be anything really new to us. It says to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. Okay? And what is this? Anybody familiar with this part of the country or this part of the region? Anybody? Where would this part of the world be considered as today? We may have seen it on maybe some national news left or international. It's, in the Middle East. it's modern day what? It is modern day Turkey. Yeah. Okay. Good. That's what it. Northern. Well, let me see. I can. No, it's kind of. It's more. I'm trying to draw something up, man. Don't lag, dog. Uh, I'm, I'm just. Let it roll, man. Go. It's my G Baby's chicken and nugget. Yeah. Amen. All right. But we got uh, Galatia somewhere up in here. We've got. Uh, I'm not sorry, Bithynia. We got Bithynia down here. We got the Mediterranean Sea right here, somewhere in this region. We've got the Dead Sea up in here. South of here is Jerusalem. That sea below Turkey. It's it, no. I believe Jerusalem is actually. I think I had a map. Well, the side by side. Okay, so. <coughs> I got. I forgot. I got. I got a. Uh, Marty here. Man. Right. Yeah. Well, no, I'm sorry. Geo. I'll mean, be quiet. He's a geo. No. <laughs> I forgot, man. He, he got the geo, the geo guy. I'm just giving you a quick, but he is right. There is, it is, if you look at the map, it's, it's kind of. One's on a mountain, one's on the Yeah. Sea so Jerusalem here. Rome is way over here. Uh, Pontius is right here. What is it? Pontius, Pontius, Pontius. I mean, Ephesus is in there, but we're not talking about Ephesus. Right. But Ephesus is actually right here. I remember this. Right. Looking at Paul's missionary journey. And I know for, for some of you who, who like to actually see things who are visual retentive, it'll make a lot more sense. So <coughs> that's my that's my chicken and nugget for tonight. All right. And then, then you got the, I don't even know how to pronounce it, I think it's the Aegean or the Aegean Sea that's right. west, kind of kind of south, southeast of Rome, but west of Ephesus. And when you read, when you go through the prison epistles of the Apostle Paul, which I thought we were going to continue in, uh, this is what you will actually see uh, between those points over here. But this is, as Marty said, is modern day uh, Turkey. All right. So if you see a lot of those things that are happening today, it, it's prophetic. All right. this is, these are some of the things that are taking place, have been prophesied. Isaiah uh, even talks about it. Uh, Jer I mean, uh, Ezekiel, Daniel. Amen. So that's that's where we are, just to give you a little bit of what's going on. Uh, verse 2, elect according to the what? Okay, this is important to know. All right, if you did not know, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, has an absolute foreknowledge. In fact, uh, the Bible declares, I believe, in uh, Isaiah 42 and 9, that behold... God says, I do a thing that pass away. All right. And then he says, behold, even though the old thing has passed away, I'm still the same God that will do a new thing. And the new thing that I promise to tell you, it's already prepared. And I'm going to promise if I say it, I'm going to do it. <laughs> All right. So I like, I love the foreknowledge of God, because let me tell you, to most of us in here who are parents, and I say everybody here, maybe except for CT, okay, is a parent, right? Some of the things that my children have brought before my wife and I has kind of taken my breath away. <laughs> All right. I've been in some situations, Kenny, where my daughter would drop something on me and I'm kind of like, <sighs> but you can't do that on God. Okay. There's nothing that we bring before Jesus that surprises him. 
You can't come to the you can't come to our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He knows everything. He sees everything. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. You can't surprise God. You can't do it. That's why you have to remember. And who 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 better to know this than Peter? I remember Jesus having a conversation with Peter, telling Peter, Satan, get thee behind. <laughs> Talking to a spirit, right? And, and, you know, I, and Peter, you know, he said, man, this, this brother always had the foot and mouth syndrome. He, he, he seems like he always taught more than, than really he should have been listening. But in fact, we see that he writes the letter. He's lived an experience with the, with, the, with the Messiah of the earth. And now he can testify to the foreknowledge of the God that he served. How many times do you believe in the under, because a lot of things are not even captured in the scriptures, but how many, if you were to sit here and just imagine, how many things do you think Peter probably said or done that Jesus sat back and laughed and then later prophesied to him right now what Peter was going to do, act, and how he was going to say it? Mm -hmm. It's no different than us. You can't surprise God. This is the same God, all right? This is the same Jesus that was crucified on a tree from the sixth into the ninth hour. So much so that his only begotten father, and Isaiah said that it even it pleased, it pleased the father to bruise his son. But yet because evil, lust, sin, all the nasty stuff was dealt with, there is nothing under the sun that can surprise our God. It's beautiful. It's, it's, it's an amazing thing when you start to try to try to make an attempt to understand the type of God that you and I serve. It's an awesome thing. So he says here, uh, the elect, according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, God the Father, the Father. That word Father represents what? Represents God. We see that God the Father, but Father represents what? I'm looking for one word in particular. If, if, if I'm a son and he's a father, that represents what? What's that mean? Relationship. Okay. So again, and you're going to see it as the letter continues to go a little bit deeper, that this word righteousness in the form of relationship becomes important. Right. God the Father. God the Father in the context. He says God the Father in what? <coughs> What's the word there? Sanctification. Sanctification. All right. What is this word sanctification? To make, yeah, to make holy, right? Okay, to make holy. I, I'll buy that. But it is an ongoing process. of being made holy. Okay? Sanctification. And listen what Peter says. It's the sanctification of the what? The work of the Spirit. The what? Work, the, work of the, spirit. the Spirit. See, what most folks ain't telling you is that sanctification, and there's a reason why Peter puts an emphasis on Spirit. And in most biblical translations, that word spirit is even capitalized to represent the Holy Spirit. Okay? One thing about sanctification is it's an ongoing process. And it has to be an ongoing process because the process of somebody being made holy, it has to be constant. Why? Because there's constant indwelling of us in an unclean world. When we, even though we are still holy people, we live on an earth. We live, we talked about this when we studied Ephesians chapter 6. We live in a dimension. We live in a realm. We live in a heaven. Whatever word, of, we live in a firmament, all right? And we can, the news has just been nasty the last 48 hours. Okay? You ain't missing anything. Stand in your face. It's been nasty the last 48 hours. Good wrenching. Brought, I was in tears the other night in my bedroom talking to my wife about it. It hurts. It hurts your soul. But that is a reminder of the importance of why sanctification is an absolute must. 
Because I'm telling you, if you do not allow the Holy Spirit to have an ongoing relationship, which creates an ongoing process of making one holy, Brother Paul, you will lose your mind. Okay? But here's the catch with this. And you're probably hearing this in most biblical settings, but when you see the word spirit, and we, and we talked about this last week, even in Ephesians 6, that the Holy Spirit is not the only thing that can sanctify a man. Okay? When we talk about sanctification and making someone, if it's not by the Spirit of God, then now you're not talking about holy things because everything that comes from the Spirit of God is what? Holy. So any other spirit or anything else that's not of the Spirit of the living God, what it subsequently does is it sanctifies you in another way. You've got to be careful with that. I always, I always tell my children, even my G baby, you got and my and, and my daughter, you got to be extremely careful of what you allow her to see, what you allow her to listen to, what goes in her ears, what goes in her eyes, because these things eventually they're going to produce. There's a byproduct and a reproduction if you don't put her in a place to be sanctified, even at three years old. All right, I'm telling you. I saw a kid online the other day, was like nine years old, cussed more than a grown man. And it's funny. It's a, uh, what, what do they call that thing, man? Um, yeah, it's sick. But it's a thing that they're doing out there now, man. There's so much they're doing out there. A vine. Yeah, that vine. And they think vine is cool with these vines with these nine-year-olds. And that, this is... There's this challenge out there now where people are laying out dead and they got a bunch of expensive stuff laying around them. And man, it is. They doing what? Yeah, we'll talk about it, but it's. it's, it's, it's they ain't doing that dead, bro. <laughs> yeah, bro. You'd be surprised. Yeah, yeah you, you would be, be. You would be. So, again, I just wanted to hark on that sanctification piece because, again, it's perpetual. It's an ongoing process because, trust me, you and I always need to be in a position where God himself can continually make us holy. We're surrounded by a lot of evil. And if there's anything we need to rest upon our lives, to rest upon our homes, to rest upon our church, and even to rest upon our schools, is the glory of Jesus Christ. We need God's glory. We need the glory of God because when the glory of God shows up, I am a living witness. God really doesn't need us. The glory works without us. But it, that a lot of that move of God is predicated upon his children, upon his sons. Mm -hmm. Sanctification is an absolute. And we could really, really harp on, I mean, I could, we could go back to the book, I mean, Romans, we could... We could, we could stay there a little while. But the emphasis, the, the moral of the story is, is to let you know that it's, a continue, it's perpetual. It's nonstop. Right. And the way that you can test it to see if you're in the mold or in the way of holiness is to look at where you are and what necessary steps as a, as a saved, filled man are you doing to ensure that you never remove yourself from the mode of sanctification. It's powerful. Because now when I can look at my life, Marty, I see a lot of fruit that's being produced that doesn't represent holiness, which is a clear indication that I'm not in the mode of sanctification. And I'm not trying to be uh, hip-hop, rap, and rhyme, but it sounds like a lot of what I'm saying, saying in my head is starting to rhyme. Pray for me, Kevin. Okay? You're doing awesome, buddy. Hey, Amen. God is awesome. God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for what? To obey Christ. To obey who? Jesus Christ. Go back to the Old Testament and see, tell me, how many times do you see the prophets say that even obedience is better than the sacrifice? Because you got to remember under the Old Testament sacri uh, system of worship, it was done predominantly by how? Sacrifice. There was a year of atonement where the priests under the, the Levite priesthood would go into the HOH or the Holies of Holies. They would come from the outer court to the inner court to the Holy of Holies and they would atone for the sins of their people before God. And there were sacrifices that, have to, that had to be laid out. You saw even from the beginning uh, during Cain and Abel's day, what did God require? A sacrifice. All right. He from the beginning. So God hasn't changed. We have to obey. One of the greatest tools and one of the greatest vehicles
to be in the mode of sanctification is to be a son who obeys his father. I tell my kids that all the time. My daughter, she quick to come on. She's 16 now. Well, I'm telling you, Jesus, help me. Daddy, I need my nails done. Now, you don't need your nails done. You want your nails done. But why, is it, why do I have to tell a 16-year-old to remind you to clean the kitchen and to keep your room up? But yet you're very quick to come and ask me for things that you want but you don't need. And what she hasn't figured out yet is all you have to do is what your mom and dad tell you to do. And a lot of times you can get what you want. It's no different in the spirit realm. We come and, and we pull it on the rope or the train of God. God, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. But what have you given your father? When's the last time you obeyed him when he called you and told you to do something? You can't, I tell you, you can't fool him. He has a foreknowledge. So again, this, this sanctification thing that we're talking about tonight is absolutely predicated upon sincere obedience to a God who knows already who you are. Got to obey. Then it says, and the sprinkling of the blood of who? Jesus Christ. Okay. And we get, a lot of folks get caught on the sprinkling. Man, what is this sprinkling thing? All right? And I, and I always go back to Catholicism. I'm not taking a stab at Catholicism. Not tonight, anyway. Uh, but <laughs> it's sprinkling, all right? Because we get this thing in Catholicism, and the way of Catholicism has taken infant baptism through sprinkling. And we know that baptism, when that word from Greek to English is translated, that is to bury. That is an actual full under, okay? We can go back to even the uh, uh, the the... the Mm. the Ethiopian that was baptized and asked to be baptized when the books and the writings of Isaiah were written, right? But when you look at sprinkling of blood, and I want, I want to cover this just so we, we understand, is that you're only going to find that three times in Scripture. Okay? Exodus 24 is the first one. And this is for sprinkling. Just so we know. And you can go teach somebody else. But Exodus 24, you'll find, and I believe it's verses 5, 6, 7, and 8. But what you'll find in the 24th chapter of Exodus is God commands Moses to go on top of the Mount of Sinai and to consummate the Ten Commandments or the, or the law of the Pentateuch or the first, first five books. And you talked about this, brother, even in your testimony. And we thank God for that last week. Wasn't that a good thing that Brother Paul did last week in Jesus' name? Well, Amen. Mm -hmm. He talked about this. And what God did is he had him sprinkled with blood to consummate or to approve the law that God had established through a man. The second time you'll find the sprinkle of blood is also in Exodus. That's Exodus chapter 29 when Aaron, the biological son of Moses, sends his sons out to be sprinkled with blood because they're about to be ordained as Levitical priests. Okay? The final time that you'll find this, I believe, is in Leviticus chapter 14. And what the priest, the same priest that will go into the Holy of Holies to atone for the sins of the people, would actually sprinkle the lepers as a sign of spiritual cleansing, not only in their heart and in their, in their souls, but physical. Physically, they were healed through the sprinkling of the blood that came from the priest. Why? Because the priests were deemed to be what? Holy. These were brothers that were in a constant state or a constant communion with God. And not to go kind of left field, but when you go to, to Paul's teaching in his letters to Timothy, it says that if there any be sick among you, let him go to the who of the church? Oh. To the elders of the church. And the reason you go to the elders is because just like the priests of the Old Testament, the elders are subsequently the priests of the New Testament. Because the elders of the church should always be in a constant place of communion through the Holy Spirit to Jesus Christ. So if I'm sick or if I'm jacked up, I should be able to come to the elders of the church because they're in a place with God like the Old Testament priests and I can get a prayer through. But the problem with a lot of these weak churches that are out here in 2018 is you've got elders that are not in direct communion with God. And now we've got a bunch of elders with a bunch of brothers with titles of elders but possess no power. Right. And you ain't got to edit that one. So again, too, say that again. So that each sacrifice is sprinkled on the altar. Amen. So you 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 see that there's you see that the because a lot of people they they say man I ain't, I don't get that right. So we we see how even and that's a great point. 
how even in the under the new covenant and under the death of a testator through Jesus Christ, a lot of what you what you seen or what you saw back then we don't do today. Doesn't mean we don't represent and we don't we don't reference the blood of Jesus Christ because it's the blood that covers and it's the blood that saves and it's the blood that redeems. I ain't crazy. <laughs> Amen. All right. So those are your first. Well, my Bible, not, not what I see. First, uh, that's only two verses. Any comments or questions about what we talked about thus far in verses one and two? Good? All, good. All right. I didn't finish it. For the obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Christ, grace to you and peace, all right, be multiplied. This is this is important. <laughs> what, what I tell you about the Apostle Paul, even in his in his letters, in the Pauline letters, in his salutation, Paul never says what? Be blessed. Yeah, that's something we kind of we kind of adopted. Even I was thinking about it today, Paul. I mean not Kevin. I get all y'all mixed up. Y'all y'all my brothers. But I'm like, I don't know if I think it was the Holy Spirit, but I, I keep hearing people sneeze today. And I'm like, brother. Why do we say bless you when, when we want to buy the L.I.L.A.? Y'all ever thought about that? I was like, man, what? So I stopped saying it. I'm like, that don't, I said, man, I don't know. Does it make sense? Why, why do we do it? Maybe it's just an, an American. You know, why, you know why people do it, though. Right? I don't. Oh. It was, it's from a, a druid or a pagan from where they would bless the person when they sneezed because they thought that it was by sneezing he was caught he was sneezing out of spirit. he was sneezing out bad spirits uh -huh. so they would provide you a blessing so that you so to, to make sure you're out there with the, with the right spirit instead of having those evil spirits okay got educated tonight okay that's why I stopped saying that maybe there was a little maybe when I was growing up we would talk yeah. to say God bless you yeah yeah right. And if you didn't have the God, you yeah, you were, you were you were cursed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hey, man. that's good. Okay, but notice again, Peter's posture is the very same way, even in his greeting, even in, his, in the salutation of his letter. Grace be multiplied, grace and peace. Because if anything in our life need to be multiplied, I'm gonna tell you, it ain't natural blessings. The last thing we need is more stuff. Brother Scotty was telling me, man, that Lincoln County is about to raise up another. A 250 some storage unit here probably within the next 90 days to support consumerism and that's buying a bunch of junk that can't fit in our home so now we pay somebody else another extra bill a month to possess stuff and to store stuff that we possess that we don't even use that don't eventually use it. outlive us or we're, we're, we'll die and like, you know, that's where we're at okay so again if there's anything that needs to be multiplied in the life of the disciple it should be grace and peace amen, amen. trust me you're going to need it if anything you're going to need is the grace of Jesus Christ him giving us things or giving us stuff that we do not deserve that's grace and we need peace and I don't care how much money you own you can never buy the peace of Jesus Christ that surpasses human understanding you can't do it you cannot do it. Peter says, let it be multiplied. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father. Okay, And you can start to see a lot of the tones are very similar uh, to the Apostle Paul. Blessed be the God, our Father, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy, okay, abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, what is he saying? Okay. Blessed be the God. So it's, again, it goes back up there. Um, two and three kind of go together. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I want to read it in the New American. Go for it. Let's say. Blessed be, God, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So what did verse 2, when we just got finished reading verse 2, verse 2, if you read it through the whole thing, it says, We are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. So blessed be the God who foreknowledge us, and you know, have foreknowledge us to be chosen. Yeah. So, you know, and, and it's saying that... Um, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again into the living hope um, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. from the dead. Mm -hmm. 
So, I mean, it, you know, it, it just kind of, it, it's both two and three are, are kind of going together. It's the same thought. Mm -hmm. That God, that it's, it's God's blessing and his foreknowledge mm -hmm. That knew who we were going, to, who we are, right, and who we were going to be, right, under because of what Jesus Christ had done on the cross. Amen. So again, to, to, to caveat, God's salvation is actually grounded and rooted in God's mercy. That makes sense. You give me the crazy eye, like that dude. All right, all right. Amen. So again, God's salvation is rooted. On God's mercy. But notice the tone of the letter in, in verse 3. Bless. We're blessing God. You have the opportunity as a believer to bless the God who already has everything. You ever thought about that? I can bless the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How do I do that? How do you bless God as men who follow and chase after him? By obeying. The simple obedience that he taught that Peter speaks of in verse 2. Come on, y'all. We bless him by doing right. Honoring. Reverence. Deep respect. <laughs> I can bless the God. I can bless, uh, be the God I follow the Lord Jesus Christ according again to his abundant mercy who has begotten us to a living hope. It is, this is the hope of Jesus Christ from the dead. From the dead. So now we see that God has really given believers a new spiritual life. All right? He's giving us new life. He's given us a new life. He's basically taken the old us, he's erased it, and now created and allowed us to walk in newness. This is good. And this is also an indication if you're out there witnessing and talking and spreading the good news, you can see where men are struggling. You can tell by the fruit of a man and what he walks and what his life yields if he's walking in newness. All right? If you moping around all day, man, on your third divorce, all right, woe is me. You walking around sucking on like you've been sucking on lemons, you probably ain't walking in the newness of life. All right? These are simple indicators that let us know that we need to be constantly praying for one another. We need to constantly be following up with one another. Even if through a text message or a phone call and say, hey, bro, how you doing? Let's go eat, come to my house, go shoot, go hunt, whatever it is. I got to make sure Kevin is good to go. And I pray that Kevin is, is looking after me in that realm of the spirit because we both desire to live in newness. I don't think any man in his God-given mind wants to walk around with a book and just be bogged down with sin and, and the debauchery and the debauch of this, I, I just don't believe that. I believe it's, it's somewhere, even in the wicked heart of a man, that he wants to be somebody. He wants to not just only be somebody and to be recognized, but he wants to be somebody and be recognized by this Creator, Jesus Christ. I don't care who you are. And I said, man, that's a cool tattoo. I got this tattoo when I was full in sin. This tattoo was nothing more than a representation of my heart needing to be transformed through the newness of the man that I tattooed on my arm. Man, I was high. I was drunk when I got this. It is nothing but a cry. <laughs> my heart, my soul was desperate to be made over and to walk in the newness that at 15 when I ignored my call that I was supposed to be walking in Marty years ago. That's all it was. Every man wants to be recognized by his creator. And then if he doesn't turn to the creator, he turns to everything else. Trust me, I know. All right? And you see again abundant mercy. When you look at the mercy of God, and when you look through the scripture, you see uh, even in, in God's mercy, you know, it's God really not giving us what we absolutely deserve. And I tell people all the time, look, just because God has an abundant amount of mercy, don't put him in a position where you, he's got to use that mercy on you. Because even though it's abundant, it, it, I don't know if he's going to deal it out to you in that particular moment or that instance of time. Okay, God's mercies, even though it's abundant, it's nothing that you should ever as a believer take advantage of. Don't do it. Don't do it. Do not do it. Amen? Good. Verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, 
and that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you. What is that? What's this inheritance? Uh, Jesus. Jesus Christ? Eternal life. Eternal life. Mm -hmm. Okay. So is that our living hope? Yes. Okay. It's our living hope. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing I want you to understand because when you look at that word and it's like I looked at it another day. It's like Chloronomoia. It's kind of where they get the metanoia and repentance and changing one's mind. But that word from Greek to English, when you look at it, it's not only talking about an inheritance that's eternal in heaven, but it's to remind the believer through Peter's writings and even through the Apostle Paul, because he talks about and makes a reference to the same inheritance that we're supposed to be reaping some of that here on the earth. Mm -hmm. And what we've got to be very cautious of is that it's not through the means of always receiving something from God in the way of material. Because we're, we're, we're believers and we're, we're Christians and modern day Christians have kind of missed the mark. Is we define how blessed we are by how much stuff we possess. And let me tell you something. The amount of things that you possess has nothing to do. There's no way is that an indication of where you are in relationship to the Son of Jesus Christ. This goes back to what Jordan was preaching on on this past two Sundays. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, we can amount all the things we want, but when we die, where is it going to be at? It's nowhere. Mm -hmm. But when you sit here and you read this verse, and it says, what's being reserved for us? And where is it being reserved for us? It's not here on earth. Mm -hmm. It's in heaven. That's right. You know, so this, you know, we have an inheritance Beautiful. that's greater than, that anything we can amount, it's more it's more valuable than the one point billion dollars that somebody won down South America in, in South South Carolina. Oh. You know, I mean it's it, it's just unreal. And yeah. we don't recognize it because we're so caught up in our manna yeah. that we don't really recognize the inheritance mm -hmm. that we have in Christ that is eternal, mm -hmm. is reserved for us in heaven. We will not be lost. There's nothing that can separate us from Come that. On. Beautiful, and, it's, and I think sometimes we we lose hope of that. We we, we lose do. we lose excuse me we lose sight of that, mm -hmm. which causes us to lose hope. Amen. Of who we really are. Mm -hmm. But when we begin to recognize that, hey, there's nothing that I can ever achieve on earth that's going to it even come, come, come compare no. to the inheritance I'm going to have when I pass away. Mm -hmm. And we just had a very good friend of ours pass away, Jim Mundy. Some of you may have known him. He was the principal at um at um, uh, Rock Springs um, school years ago. But I mean, you know, a very godly man, very honest man. I mean, that's one of the things you heard in his, in, in, in his um, celebration mm -hmm. was how, how he was a godly man and how he was a very honest man. He followed God. He loved God. Amen. And, you know, in his inheritance, he's seeing his inheritance. Yeah. He left behind characteristics and traits. And his inheritance, mm -hmm. is he, he's, he's, he's seeing that and it's beyond belief. Yeah, that's it. And that's got to be on the forefront of our hearts. Because if you don't remember, these, these simple things, like the cross, right, the bloodshed, the eternal inheritance, these are things that give us hope. They do. They give me hope. I can't speak for any man in here. I can speak for Cliff. They give me hope. They keep me fighting. Even when I don't feel like teaching. Even when I don't feel like preaching. Even when I don't feel like evangelizing and testifying about the goodness of Jesus Christ. It gives me hope. It gives me hope. I mean, you mentioned, hey, you mentioned just a little while ago, I mean, how we can look at what's happened in the past 48, 64 hours. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just been an unreal was a mm -hmm. amount of events that's happened yeah. from the weekend to now. Amen. Not just nationally, but also locally in, in, in Charlotte area and oh, stuff like that. Right. And you sit there and you say, and, and you, we can get so depressed. Yeah, very easy. By seeing that. But, mm -hmm. just like we just got finished learning in Ephesians chapter 6, what are we supposed to be doing? Come we're on. supposed to be standing Stand. with, the full, with the full armor of God if we are constantly in prayer, when we're seeing those things, yes, it should burden our hearts, mm -hmm. but not burden our hearts because, oh, that was a total jerk that mm -hmm. sent all those bombs, or that was a total jerk that went into that synagogue. No, understand it's the evil forces. All right. And so if, we can, if, we, if we're sitting here and we're standing in the presence of God, 
and we're rec- and we recognize our inheritance and we're not and our focus is not on manna then when we're constantly praying to God we're seeing these things and yes it grieves our heart it grieves mine but yet we still recognize who's in control that's right and we recognize that hey it's not the person mm-hmm we need to pray for the guy that's still alive and send all those bombs because hope maybe one day and hopefully within jail, he'll see Jesus Christ. That's right. You know, Ted Bundy, who killed numerous college girls back in the 70s, you know, died in prison in, in Florida, but he became a Christian. Now, I know, you know, if I was a dad and I heard that, that Ted Bundy was going to be in heaven, yes, I would be, mm, gosh, you know, he killed my daughter. But if we recognize the salvation of Jesus Christ, you know, we're all guilty of sin. So, you know, when I when I begin to see that focus, then I in some ways, even though I lost my daughter, I can be celebrated that, that guy's in heaven. That's right. So, and so if we can begin to see the evil forces that are working instead of just the people working, yeah. then we begin to, to be know how to pray mm-hmm. for our nation and how to pray for the leaders, no matter who the leaders are. That's right. Because you one thing you'll you'll notice never and nowhere nowhere. And you'll see this as we read in 1 Peter. There is nowhere do you see where they say, denounce the leadership of the government. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, all this bickering that we have on TV, there, not nowhere in Scripture in are you going to see yeah. anything that says denounce. In fact, what, it's the opposite. Amen. I mean, Paul, Paul wrote, Peter writes, pray for your leaders. That's right. This is the guy that's going to be beheaded or, or cru- uh, crucified by right. tradition, right. Mm-hmm. crucified upside down by Nero. Mm-hmm. You know, who's Paul? Paul got his head chopped off, but never once did they he denounce or say, "Hey, you need to have a rebellion against the Roman government." Yeah, government. You know, yeah. here we are in America, and maybe we not like well, who's in president or who isn't in president or whatever, but it doesn't make a difference because God's put him there. Mm-hmm. And my attention is really on winning souls for Christ. I'm going to let God be the God of whoever He wants to put in heaven. I'm going to do what He's asked me to do. I'm sorry. There you go. What do you say? <laughs> well, those souls are all the things you take with you there. Mm-hmm. Nothing else. It's kind of like, man, what? You have to ask yourself <laughs> in faith, what really matters? Mm-hmm. I mean, what, what really matters to you, to me? Didn't somebody in the, in the scriptures talk about for, for me to to live and to die and gain or something like that? That's, that's Paul. I don't read my Bible too much, but every time I pick it up, I, it says something like that. Yeah. First Philippians. Yeah, it's something like that. I don't know. First one. Right. <coughs> what? Uh, all right. You know, I was going to say. Yes, sir. When I first read these first four yeah. verses. My first thought that came to my mind is yeah. a little different than what you've been saying here, but it's the same thing. Amen. Um, Peter was the, an apostle to Jewish people. So if you read right. this thing that he's writing to the Jews, mm-hmm. the Jews put a lot of importance on inheritance. Yes. Right? Over right. and over That's and good. over. Again. Right on. And a good example is the fact that people promised the promise. That's right. God denied him it for 80 years. Mm-hmm. Think about that for a little while, right? Um, the prodigal son, yeah, the, the same point. story. Mm-hmm. They wanted their inheritance one way or another. And that maybe changes it a little bit if you understand it with Jewish people. I don't I want to be careful. I think we're writing primarily to Jewish believers. Mm, Jewish Christians. Trying yes, to relate it to them. These were Jewish people who had become Christians, mm-hmm. but I hate to say it, they still had this Jewish yeah, mindset, mindset, whatever yeah. you want to call it, mm-hmm. to, right. to try to understand is that your inheritance is not the inheritance of the law. It's not a promised land like you think it is. Mm-hmm. It's well beyond that. Amen. That's good, yeah. Paul. I like it. And even that, that can be even related to us, even from, because again, going back to the old, and and being uh, Gentile to now being saint, you know, it, it, it's that, that very powerful. By the way, just to take that a little further, mm-hmm. to those going, the Gentiles who heard this, they only thought of life up to the point of death. That's right. And it ended. Stop right there. Right. 
And all of a sudden they're being told, no, you have eternity. Yeah. Life after life. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's a, that's a, you know, if you never were raised with that, yeah. that's a wild concept. Mm -hmm. okay? And it's one of the things that's bothered me today about people is mm -hmm. you say that you believe in a life after death. Mm -hmm. And most people will say yes. And they say, well, where are you going to spend it? Yeah. <laughs> and that, that gets them well, upset, yeah. okay? Because they only got two options, mm -hmm. okay? <laughs> what I like to call a good place and a bad place, sorry. Right? And, but when you force them to think about it, yeah, right, it does change perspectives. That's right. It changes how you think, <coughs> how you react, and what motivates you, and why you do things. Amen. It's very good. Very good. Verse five: Who are kept by the power of who? Us. Okay. So. That's power. Okay. Long clock, your iPhone, your iPad, I don't know what you think that may wake you up in the morning, but let me let me let me put the, the disclaimer out there the, the PSA, the public service announcement. If God don't into your body, right. then that thing will keep going off and ringing. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. yes, okay, so don't let anybody tell you, and the devil in hell should ever tell you that any power that you get, it don't come from you, Kenny, it comes from God. Yes, sir. Okay. It is God who has the power to keep. And how does he do that? Peter says, through faith. It is through you believing God for what? Salvation. Salvation ready to be revealed when? Right now. And how convenient for what's been even going on, what Marty and I have made reference to in the last 48 hours, if we've ever lived in an hour, that needs to be introduced to another power outside the demonic force of this earth. It will be in the last time that you and I live in right now to let somebody know that there's a somebody named Jesus who can change their life. This is powerful. The last time, it's right now. <laughs> It's the hour that the hours that we're living in the dispensation of time through the grace of Jesus Christ that Peter will make reference to is right now. And I'm going to tell you, there's no demonic principality that is going to spread the good news of salvation. If it does not come from the sons of God, who then shall it come from? We got to get busy. Amen. <coughs> Six, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by what? Okay. What type of man, saved and filled with the spirit of the living God in his right mind, would ever take a re would ever take a happy rejoicing stance that I've got to endure something that's uncomfortable to my flesh? Why is that necessary? Who who? Ross, for real? Do I need to share what I do? I need to share this, right? I mean, do you really understand what I've got to endure? Will you understand what even the, some of the some of these apostles and prophets have had to endure? And you telling me, man, we're supposed to sit back and and, and, and just and be rejoiceful about it? Somebody embrace else. the suck, huh? Yeah, embrace the what? Embrace the suck, <laughs> huh? But your viewpoint. As Brother Paul talked about tonight, should be different because now your mind is in Christ. And when Christ really has your mind, it didn't. Cliff, you ain't get back to reality. Okay? It doesn't negate the fact that you're still going to feel a certain way, or that there are going to be pains or emotions that are attached to this trial. But what it does is it gives you the power and the peace to be able to stand regardless of what God is. Listen to what I'm saying. To, even regardless of God knowing what's going on in your life. Because as Marty said earlier, there's a sovereignty of what the Bible deems as a divine providence that even though there's calamity and confusion in the earth, our God is still in control. Sure. It's all part of the hope, CT. Regardless of what's going on north, south, east, west, and the four corners of the earth that Revelation speaks of, my God still has control. And not only control, but Marty, he's got some authority. <laughs> and none of that authority is embraced by power. 
And don't forget foreknowledge. He already knew it. Oh, yeah. And of course, the foreknowledge. He, he knew. All of it. All yeah, yeah. And it's he knew the things we don't know yet. Don't exactly. Know. So, therefore, this ain't new to God. Nope. Don't forget that. <laughs> it doesn't surprise me. Exactly. Oh, man. So, again, we, we, we've been grieved. And Peter, I think if anybody knows that, it's him. Because he had a special, and we can see this in the scriptures, especially in the Synoptic Gospels of St. Matthew, Mark, and, and, uh, and Luke, that he had, a, he had a love for Christ. There were moments, even in, in some accounts, that he recognized Jesus and who he was above everybody else. Everybody's saying that I'm Elijah, and some say I'm, 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 I'm this. And, but, 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 but Peter, come here, man. Come here, boy. I can hear him. Come here. Yes, yes, Master. Yes, Rabbi. Rabboni. What, who do you say I am? You're the son of the living God. See, flesh, Jesus said flesh and blood couldn't reveal that to you, but only by my spirit would you would have ever known that I'm the son of the living God. That when you walk with me, you're walking with God. You're walking with the Messiah, boy. You get a gold star today, but you're going to put your foot in the mouth about 26 days from now when I'm laying on that tree. <laughs> but that's okay. I done gave you a revelation. Okay? And you got, I'm going to rename you. You're going to be the rock of, upon which this church I'm going to build, and even the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It's okay. It's, right. it's okay. I'm going to use you. And I'm going to get the glory from it. God, have mercy. Verse 7 that the genuous of your faith, that the genuous of your, the genuineness of your faith being much more pressure. I'm sorry, more precious than gold that perishes. We're going to go back to that. Though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of who? Jesus Christ. Okay? Another profound statement. The genuineness of my faith being much more precious than gold that perishes. So again, the thing that the eye, the thing that the flesh, the thing that the heart desires, one day it will outlive you. Because gold lasts for a long time. And how do I know? Because even if you're going to finish certain things that are passed along, my wife has possessions from her great, great, great. That gold's still alive. But everybody that possessed it up until my wife's point has died and gone away. Gold lasts forever. <laughs> Still going. And, and I, when she died, and I bury her, she buried me or having the Lord. Maybe Jesus will come back. Then another, somebody else, another daughter, the G baby again, is going to keep going on. But your faith, Peter says, is well more precious than even that gold. And oh, yeah, by the way, that same gold, the Bible lets me know that we'll be walking on in heaven. The stuff that people die for and kill for and wrap around their neck and put on their ring, you'll be walking on it in heaven. <clears throat> you ever thought about that? Testify by the fire. Testify by the fire that it may be found to do what? Praise, honor, and glory the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what is Peter saying that at the end of the day, once the, the, the pressurized test that Jesus himself is allowing you to go through, Right? Kind of like that storm that Pastor Joe preached about about four Sundays or five Sundays ago, right? Should have been asleep. Come down there and sleep with me. It's all good. I am the Messiah. I understand what's going on. It's not new to me. Right? Didn't surprise me. Didn't scare me, right? What should these pressurized tests, according to Peter and his epistle, really do? We just read it. What should these things do? So the worst of the worst, the baddest of the baddest, and I, that may not be good English, should just be an instance of another vehicle that can bring praise, honor, and glory to the revelation of my Father, Jesus Christ. All right, so a little history lesson, just to kind of put this thing in perspective. The Roman government at the time was not Christian, mm -hmm. okay? The Roman government still served a ton of, oh, and you, if you go to Rome, or, and I've never been there, but I mean, I'm mm -hmm. right, but if you, if you go to Rome, you go to Greece, you go to Turkey, you'll see these temples and everything else that was to every pagan guy you can ever imagine. Yeah. You know, but 
you know, like what he's just in, in what Paul was just saying here is that through the testing of whose faith, okay, now he's writing to people who are being pressured by Nero and who and who are being tortured, right? Okay, and this torture was not a simple little torture. And if you read history, you'll mm -hmm. find out that they were crucified, they were burned at the stake, it. they were fed the lions. Mm -hmm. Okay, it was we're not talking a little quick, you know, shot in the, shot in the arm type thing yeah. that, get, that gets the death penalty today. Okay. Mm -hmm. We, we're talking about people who had a face of it. But think about this. By their faith, and their testimony, and their persecution, where are we at today? The gospel of Jesus Christ has spread across the world mm -hmm. because of the faith of, at this time, now we're talking probably five, six, seven, ten thousand right. people. At most. At most at the right. time. Mm -hmm. And you think about this. And he's talking to these guys who are going through this, but he's he's giving us a foreknowledge or a, or a prophecy or a a, a view yeah. of what's going to happen because of their te because of their testimony and the way they stood against persecution, mm -hmm. and, there, and and it should be an encouragement to us to think whatever happens to us, it should be the same thing to where it advances the gospel. Of Christ. We don't know who those people are. Mm -hmm. We know who Paul is. We know who Peter is. We don't know all those people, mm -hmm. but yet those people, and because of their faith and their knowledge in God, it changed the Roman Empire 300 years later, you know, by storm, it, by storm mm -hmm. it changed the world yeah, it because of the faith that people had in who? The unstoppable God. That's right. You know, and so you sit there and you go, wow. Yeah. And you sit there and you read this and you just have to say, God, thank you for those suffering. Yes, Jesus. And I pray that I can be yeah. that same person Amen. to where no one will know my name, yeah. but because of my faith, your word continues on. That's right. Because yeah. it's not about me. Just yeah. like what John said. Yeah. You know, it's not me. Yeah. It's Jesus. It's him. Yeah. And when they were baptized. That's right. I'm going to become less so he can become more. Amen. Amen. Hide me behind the cross, Lord. Man, it's good. Verse 8, whom having not you seen, you love. Though now you do not see him yet believing, faith, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. See, what Peter does, and which I think, and not think, but I know that really relates to us, is he gets past what most wouldn't even consider to be logic in today's society. It's not logic. Michael Ross, you're an idiot, okay? Because you're walking around proclaiming, glorifying, loving a God whom you've never seen or touched or laid eyes on. What logic does that, have you ever thought, what, I mean, is that logical? Not to the scientists. Mm, right? I don't see the hair on people neither. Right? You, you understand? You're right? But here he says that even through that, that there's love and yet you still believe. And to think that this is important to a level CT, why? Because Jesus even rebuked the ones who still failed to believe even though they held hands and walked with the Messiah. Jesus goes before Thomas in St. John chapter 14. Jesus, where are we going? You look lost, brother. Help us. Son, here, I'm going to let you know who I am again. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. It's John 14, 6, and no man can come to me or come to the Father except through me. Jesus promised and guarantees again when he dies, he gives up the ghost. He comes back. You look at the road to Emmaus. He's given them specific directive. Go and sit in this place and wait in the upper room because I will not forget about you. I will come back. The Bible says that he just he just comes in. He don't use a door. He, don't use a, he just shows up. God shows up, and here Thomas is again, being rebuked. He's in amazement, in awe. And I believe that place turned into a place of worship when you go back and read the second chapter of Acts. Beautiful. Thomas yet again, no belief. Yet Jesus takes the hand of Thomas and says, put it through this hole that's in my hand where I was just crucified. Take that same hand and put it in my side where I was poked. Thomas, now do you believe? He says, yes, master, I believe. Jesus says, thank God you believe. 
But here's the catch, brother. Or here's the catch, son. You believe because you've seen, but greater to those who believe who have never even seen me. It's a blessing. You never lay eyes on it. But one day, we will see our king. One day. One day, Kenny. One day. Verse 9. Receiving the end of your faith, the what? The salvation of your soul. All that persecution, all those trials, all the stuff when folks made fun of you when you were standing out at the gas station talking about your Jesus, telling somebody who was dead man, dead woman, walking about your God. Jesus says, because, because you hung in there and you believed in me, I saved your soul for eternity. <laughs> You're secure in glory. You're secure. Brother Marty said earlier, it's reserved. That's me going to the finest restaurant in the state of North Carolina. And Michael Jordan can show up and he can't sit in my seat because it's been, it's been reserved for Cliff. <laughs> you can't sit there, brother. I know, I know you were a bad boy when you was in Chicago, but that's for me. <laughs> it's reserved. It's, it's got my name on it. And we've got to understand, even coming out of Ephesians 6, dealing with principalities, that Jesus also dealt with this. Because as soon as the apostles realized the power and the authority that they walked in, they were commanding certain spirits. They came back with a braggadocious pride before Jesus, saying, Jesus, you got to check this out. This old, oh, we was down here just messing around, and we, we got here casting out devils. Jesus said, hold on now, let me, let me take your pride behind something real quick. See, you having authority over spirits should be automatic because you because I live in you, and you, in, and, you know, because you abide, the abiding, that should be automatic. But he said, rather rejoice that your names have been etched in the Lamb's Book of Life. Yeah. Yeah. You want to get excited about something. Let your name be in the, in the, in the, in the guest book. That's what you rejoice about. Verse 10, he says, Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the <laughs> grace that would come to you. Okay? When you think about major prophets, you have major and you have minor. When you think of, especially in, in the writings of Daniel, which correlate directly with the book of Revelation, and you look at Isaiah, they prophesy of the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. Isaiah even says in the 53rd uh, chapter that he was bruised by iniquity, <laughs> for the transgressions and, the, and all of this were upon us, and, our, and our, all of it. He prophesies and says that he's coming. A, a, a man will be perfect, he will be sinless, he will be a lamb that goes before the slaughter, but will have victory in his hands. And yet because of that prophecy, we are the recipients of what was prophesied through God's man. Because again, as Paul brought up tonight, this is Peter, a Jew, writing to Jewish believers, yet we have been, we are, and remember Paul's teachings in even the book of Galatians and Ephesians, that we were aliens. We were, we're not of the commonwealth of the house of Israel, yet you and I, of a Gentile people, can now be recipients and we can be, our names can be written in this Lamb's Book of Life with every other, with every other Jew who believes because we've been exposed to salvation through Jesus Christ. That's grace. That's the dispensation of grace because now this is constantly being dispensed like a candy machine. You dispense it. You put the quarter in and it dispenses. You put your faith in God, he dispenses grace. This is what he's saying. The dispensation of grace is powerful. My God. Prophesy of the grace that will come to you. The grace. Verse 11. Searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. What is Peter saying here? In verse 11. Saying that Jesus is going to die for our sins. Okay. The prophets were, were telling us things that were going to happen and it was past their lifetime. Okay. So really it's not the what of salvation, but it's the when. There you go. 
but it's the when of salvation, the time, the timing, the timing. Because now, you know, we, we, we've heard about it. Now, when is the time coming that we're going to receive it? You know, we want it. We want this thing called salvation. Okay? And this is what the prophets had prophesied. And they were nothing more than the mouthpieces of God. Okay? They were not. And understand, a prophet, they weren't inventors of their own ideas. Okay? They weren't just a bunch of brothers sitting around coming up together and, 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 and conjuring up uh, some great ideas that sounded cool. No, they were actually hearing from God. Right? They were hearing from God. And a lot of times when you study the prophet, they didn't always come bearing good news. <laughs> a lot of the times they would come preaching damnation because y'all failed to get it right the first time that God sent me the first time to talk to you. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Verse 12. To them it was revealed that, this, this is the revelation, not to themselves but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things which angels even desire to look into. That's right. Let's talk about this scripture, this verse. Because it's saying a lot. I'll read it again. Verse 12. To them it was revealed that, this is the revelation, not to themselves, but to us, not to the prophets, to themselves, but it was to us. Okay, the benefit to you and I now as a Gentile church, that they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. It was nowhere else that it was sent from but heaven. So when you walking around possessing the spirit of the living God, you actually possess a part of heaven. You ever think about that? You possess a part of heaven. But it says not only that, but the things which even angels desire to look into. What's going on? Because there's, there's actually a couple strong takeaways from this verse. Talk to me. We ain't going anywhere until you talk to me. <laughs> Understand. Because well, angels are their sole purpose is to praise God, to worship God. Okay. So let's let's before we get to the angels, let's go back everything before things which angels desire to look into. What's going on here? Somebody, uh, one of the disciples or all the disciples, passing on Jesus' words to us. Uh, I guess that's brought the part where it says um, they were not serving themselves, but you. They were trying to get stop right there. Okay. weren't serving themselves. So at the end of the day, even though human, man, that's what we are, were prophets who prophesied the words of God, it was only the Holy Spirit that was able to proclaim the absolute truth. I can preach the gospel until I turn as blue as Big Mark's shirt. But at the end of the day, when I come back from blue to my natural color, it's only the Holy Spirit through the power of the words that I speak that come from heaven are men saved by. That's where we get wrapped up, CT. We think, man, CT, a bad boy, man, he holy, he's sanctified and full of the Holy Ghost. Yeah, that's great, and we thank God for that. But CT can't send anybody to heaven or hell. Yet it's the, it's the spirit that we talked about earlier, the capital S, that he possesses that's able to bring faith to ears who've never even heard the gospel. That's why Paul writes in Romans that faith cometh by hearing, and by hearing what? The word of God. That's why it's one of the greatest indications of why man must possess God's word. I said it last Wednesday. Everybody in this room was saved by the hearing of God's word. Whether it was a preacher, a teacher, or somebody singing God's word, you came by faith because a word that was spoken, either in your heart, even through on a stage, it is coming unto faith by only the hearing of God's word. Also, it says it can't be drawn unless by the Spirit. By the Spirit. CT, man, I like you. You look good. You're a handsome fellow, man, full of the Holy Spirit. Man, but ain't nothing can draw anybody but the Holy Spirit. 
Even though we'd like to get the credit, Big Mark. And sometimes we get in the way of that. And Peter makes reference. That's why even in the suffering, the glory, the honor, and the, it all belongs to him. Paul makes it so clear in the Corinth letter. Never should a man ever desire in his flesh to glory in the presence of God. Should not ever happen. But it's easy to get puffed up. And I'm, I'm testifying. Because when you see the Holy Spirit work through you and do some things and you start laying on it and man, you see miracles and you're like, oh, you kind of, your chest get a little big. But then and the Lord has to remind you that if it not be me, <laughs> you, hmm. Now I put a pin in your balloon and you, you ever blow up a balloon and then just let it go and, and it's not tied off? Where it end up? <laughs> Somewhere. All right. Jesus had to tie me off. And son, it ain't you. It's me in you. And oh yeah, by the way, like he told an uh, old prophet, he said, man, I got, I got seven other prophets, seven thousand other prophets that ain't bowed their knee to Baal. Please don't believe that you're the only prophet that I can't use. Or that I can't, I can, like I can't raise up Brother Kenny. Just like me in this Bible study, God can sit me down. He'll bring Kenny up here and start teaching. God's still going to get the glory. If he had to bring Max and speak through Max, and Max is up here teaching every night. Good. God's going to get the glory. That's the end of the story. <laughs> Amen. 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 By the way, two other points. Yes, sir. Talk through a donkey, so he can talk to yeah, yeah, yeah. He can talk to yeah. anybody. Amen. But the other thing I wanted to bring out, and again, I've done a lot of studying on this, Amen. he was also condemning all the Jewish people. I'll go back to something I mentioned last week. Most Jewish people only read the Torah. Torah. Amen. Uh, they do not read the whole Old Testament. So mm -hmm. they miss Isaiah. They miss Daniel. They miss Micah. They miss all of that mm -hmm. stuff. It's a condemnation to a certain extent to the Jewish people. When they <coughs> did hear the words of the prophet Isaiah, these people, Right. When they heard the words of Daniel, because I'm sure not everything that was said by Peter is fully defined. Amen. All right. They said, oh my God, what have I been missing? It's a, it's a completely different mindset, okay? But you need to start to think about that. And shame, shame on them that they didn't read it. Amen. Because they had no reason not to. They had no reason. I, I shouldn't say that. They did. They had their own society right. with their own... Pharisees and Sadducees who made this thing a political mess. And I want to say they deliberately left it out mm. because they didn't know how to answer it. Mm. And I'll challenge you. You go read the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. Mm -hmm. And after you're done reading it, just say to yourself, who more perfectly fits that right. chapter? Amen. Okay. I can tell you he died 2,000 years ago. But you go read it. All right. And that, when you start to understand that, to a certain extent, it is the condemnation of the Jewish leaders yeah. for ignoring it. Right. That's what they did. They basically ignored it. I'm sorry. No. Nah. Mm -hmm. Failure to recognize mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah. Amen. Still today. Yeah, it, right. Even still today. But Even just the Jews. Mm -hmm. and you think about how, how widely accepted the Bible is and how the Bible, and I heard one, um, I'm not sure where I heard this at. Just um, we were talking about a week clip. Maybe it was that small group. Okay. Um, um, somebody in our small group mentioned that. Um, I mean, we clip. I don't know if you know who we clip is. We clip is a Bible organization that sends out uh, missionaries all around the globe to try to translate language, the Bible, into language of, of the people and the tribes of those areas. Mm -hmm. um, but they were somebody um, was saying that um, we clip projects that they'll have the gospel in every language and in every tribe. It would have been told by the year 2020, something like that. So you think about how, you know, I mean, that's one of the prophecies in the Bible mm -hmm. is that the word of God will be spread across the world and of the earth. And, and so here, here's this opportunity. But as much as that's been straight, you look at how Satan and his evil forces, as we mm -hmm. talked about in, in, in Ephesians chapter 6, have been constantly oh, yeah. bombarding that mm -hmm. and destroying that to where sure. there's countries, I mean, country. This 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 really gets me. Go for it. Go look at that map again. Mm -hmm. Where's that country at? Mm -hmm. It's in Turkey, right? Mm -hmm. How strong is Christianity in Turkey right now? 
it's not. Right. You know, yeah. I mean, but you know, it's time of day. You know, we just got finished. I'm going to take. I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem. We just got finished reading Ephesians. Okay, go to go to Revelations chapter two, and I'm going to give a short version of this. You know, John is writing a letter to seven churches. He's mm -hmm. God's telling him, I want you to write a letter seven to seven churches. Mm -hmm. The very first, we just got finished reading Ephesians. Mm -hmm. The very first letter was written to the church in Ephesians. Okay, years later, after Paul died, after Paul, Paul has died now. I mean, we're talking probably 25, 30 years later. And Jesus is sitting there and he says, you guys have done great. You you know, what, what was Paul's big, biggest things in Ephesians that he was talking about? How did we need to be really true to the word and everything else? Hey, Jesus is saying in that letter, you guys were true to the word. You held tight. You looked, you, you made sure there wasn't false teachers and everything else. However. But, mm -hmm. I have this one condemnation against you. You lost your first love. Yeah, that's right. You know? In other words, what happened is they got so caught up just like the Pharisees and the Sadducees of the Jews, mm -hmm. they got so caught up in making sure that they were being really grounded in the Word and making sure there wasn't any false teachings and everything else, that they actually forgot what Jesus said was the greatest commandment. Mm -hmm. Love the Lord your God. Not love your Bible. No. Not love your church. Not love how you serve or what you've done. But love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And then on top of that, Love your brother as yourself. Yeah, right. But what happened is they lost their first love. And you know what Jesus said? And because of that, if you don't, re if you don't mm -hmm. listen to what I'm going to do, what am I going to do? I'm going to remove the candle mm -hmm. from your thing. So now you stop and think. Here I'm looking at a map up there on the wall. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at Galatia and Ephesians oh, yeah, yeah. And, and those towns that were oh, once yeah, yeah. the bedrock, right. we just got finished talking right. about, yeah, okay. of our faith that helped expand you know the gospel of God, the gospel of Christ across the world, but where are they at right now? Mm -hmm. There's missionaries over in Turkey right now because they have lost their first candle. Mm -hmm. God hadn't stopped loving them, no. but God was going to be. But, but God's words or God's judgment is not to be something to take lightly. Absolutely not. You know, and when so when He says, "Hey, look," and that applies not only to you, Ephesus, but then you have to stop and you have to look at every one of our churches today. Mm -hmm. And Jonathan and I and, and, and other people that I've been with in other churches, we've been up to the Northeast and, and um, up in um, Maine and Vermont and stuff like that. And you'll have to go by churches where their doors are shut or turn into a Masonic Lodge or turn into a community um, center or wherever. Look, go to France or go to Germany. You know, I mean, right now when you go into these cathedrals and whatever, they're museums. Yeah. Because that lamp of God, that light, has been removed from that church Amen. because they're no longer, and so that's a test. That, that's a not a testimony. What's the word I'm trying to think? Um, that's a huh? Testament. Test. Not yeah, testament. That, 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 side, that's a brother. Huh? It's a sign. It's, it's 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 something that should we should think about constantly. What am I doing for God? And is it all about me, or is it about God? Mm -hmm. Because if it's all about me, that candlestick. Just like in a church, God lives in our heart. That candlestick's going to be removed because God's going to continue on. Mm -hmm. He don't need us. No. He wants us. Mm -hmm. He don't need us. Yeah. His word's going to carry on. Amen. Not one single dot, not one single T is going to be That's missed right. from, the, from the commands of God. Mm -hmm. His word will carry forth. It will, it will forever remain. <laughs> I just want to add one thing to what Go he says, and it goes back to that map. All of the seven churches in Revelation that he wants to all in that area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. Seven churches of Asia. And they're all falling short. Summer. Mm -hmm. And the second part of that is a, is a really a, a real blessing is uh, the things which even angels uh, desire to look into. What does that say? That even the angels are amazed at a wonderful salvation that you and I have been introduced to. Because the angels will probably some of the people that uh, prophesied to the people. No. You see, what you got to remember is is the angelic that belonged to God that weren't in those that fell during the great fall of Lucifer, of Satan, have eternally been in the resting place with God forever. They've never, they've always been in God's presence. Always in his light. So there's no, they have no, what's the word? They don't have a soul. 
No, I'm not. No, I'm talking more of an idea or Experience. right or concept. Thank you, Big Mark, of what salvation is or what it is to have to work for. When you you always in God's presence, what's the need for salvation? If I've always been in, been with Him since the beginning of time, mm -hmm. there's no need for salvation. You don't need. You're here. You're you're, you're with me. I don't know what that looks like, but that's it's just an is amazing. Is there any free will and and saying and and an angelic concept? Is there any? I don't think so. Yeah. Is there? Yes. Yeah. Satan. You Satan choose. Mm -hmm. I mean, just like you go back to that saying, Satan says, "I will, I will, I mm -hmm. will be." You know, I will set my throne above God. Mm -hmm. I will be God. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you know, they made a choice. Right. But what's amazing to angels. Is that God loved mankind so much right. that He would die for them to to draw them back somewhere? There's angels today that are stuck in a pit that are that have been in a pit for thousands upon thousands of years, right. and they will be released at the end time. But they're still there, and these and the fallen angels will never be able to come back to God. They were literally cast out. Satan knows that. Mm -hmm. You know, Satan knows his end. But because and this is and this is where you have to understand anger and hatred and everything else. When when Satan is so he's the adversary, he's the deceiver. And when you sit and think about how hatred continues to mold our brains and our thoughts, it's just the same with the angels. I mean, there's so much hatred toward what God has done in mankind Amen. that they're just so infurious because of this. That they know that they don't have that opportunity of what God did for mankind. That that, 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 that for those, especially for the, for the fallen angels, they're just they're in rebellion against it. For those that are still with God and seeing God's presence, they're totally amazed by it. Yeah, yeah. It's something that they could not do themselves. Mm -mm. That's right. It's not the Mormons. You know, we don't get our little planet. We don't get you know everyone, all this other stuff. You know, this is something that blows. The angels away, mm -hmm. and they're and Hebrews talks about they're just totally amazed mm -hmm. by what God has done through Jesus Christ. Amen. Paul makes a reference. Remember when, in Ephesians three and ten, when we were back there, we talked about the manifold wisdom that even that is exposed in the heavenly places unto the angelic beings. Mm -hmm. You know that's again through our living our life and through salvation and through coming unto salvation. We we kind of give an exposure unto them of the manifold wisdom of God, and even right. through our righteous living and in, in, in trying to obtain and to be in a constant mode of that sanctification, that being holy. And then next week, hopefully, we'll get to that point where Paul, uh, not Paul, but the Apostle Peter makes the point and the reference of, of being holy. For it has been written, even from the beginning of time, even through Paul's teaching, that we've been designed by God to not only be holy, but to be an ambassador for the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.